Welcome to, welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. And right off the bat, I want to introduce, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our Commodore, Paul Heineken. And my job is to quickly welcome all of you to another Wednesday Yachtsman's Lunch. Uh, everybody here today, everybody who's looking online and who will look online in the future. We have a fantastic uh, talk today. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about what's happening around the club. Last weekend, we had a Woody's event out here, and we had Paul Kayard sailing in a world championship in the star class uh, in Puerto uh, in Sardinia, Puerto Cervo, uh, Sardinia, Cervo, Cervo. And he finished sixth. And meanwhile, Ron was doing twice as well at the IOD Worlds uh, back east, where he got a 12th. So, so that's what's... That's what's been happening around here in the, in the yachting front. And so I'll hand this over to Matt Byers, who's uh, going to be our host today. He's fleet captain of the Loch Lomond Yacht Club, director of the Pacific Inner Club Yacht Association, director of the Pacific Coast Yachting Association, and historian for all these three organizations. So he has a lot of energy for phone and email. And thank you, Matt, for taking over today. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matthew Byers. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some upcoming Wednesday Yachtsman's luncheons. On July 31st, we have uh, Kathy Miller and Donna Tolley, who are both Sacramento County Board of Supervisors members, and they're going to be talking about the Delta County's coalition, Save the Delta to Save the Bay. On July 24th, uh, we have Stan Honey, who's the chairman of the World Sailing and Oceanic and Offshore Committee. Uh, with a new event for the 2024 Olympics. July 17th, we have uh, Jennifer Bushman, a founder of Route to Market, uh, with Full Circle, the story of Jamie Mitchell, who is a world champion surfer. July 10th, we have Matt Larson with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute with Can Whales and Ships Coexist in the Oceans? And uh, next week, July 3rd, Jeffrey Beaumont, who's the son of Arthur Beaumont, uh, with an artist paints the greatest Navy, and I believe Arthur Beaumont was the official artist for the Navy back in World War II. So today we have three great speakers. We have Jim Allen. Uh, Jim has three decades of experience conducting archaeological research, including historic, maritime, and prehistoric archaeological investigations. He's a member of the Register of Professional Archaeologists and adjunct prof associate professor anthropology at St. Mary's College here in California adjunct professor history at the University of Rhode Island, and co-director of the annual field school in maritime archaeology in Bermuda. Dr. Allen is a member of the National Park Service Historical Landmark Committee, a fellow member of the Explorers Club, and a recipient of the San Francisco Maritime National Park Association's 14th Annual Maritime Heritage Award. We also have Nazi Fino. Nazi is a geographical information systems expert and he develops and manages web and mobile-based geospatial data applications and a broad range of digital mapping technologies. He's created solutions for GIS sp uh, spatial analysts, 3D, uh, 3D analysis, analysis and visualization, georeferencing and digitizing of historic maps, modeling and automated, automated mapping, geoprocessing geo data using model builder and collecting and converting uh, surveying data from GPS total station instrumentation for mapping purposes. And Nazi holds two master's degrees in archaeology and urban planning. And our third uh, speaker, um, who really does need no introduction in this room and is why I'm emceeing today instead of him, Mr. Ron Young. Hmm. Over the past uh, last 62 years, Ron has sailed over 3,000 races across four continents. From 1983 through 2017, Ron participated in six America's Cup campaigns, from sail development coordinator to main sheet traveler to general manager and vice chairman. In 2018, uh, the Pacific Inner Club Yacht Association awarded Ron the Lloyd Ryland Historian of the Year trophy for producing over 700 talks on topics including the history of yachting in America, the America's Cup, and a broad range of nautical topics. Today's topic has fascinated Ron for decades. To research it, he pulled together a team of archaeologists and technologists uh, that will be speaking today. 
So with that said, let's jump in the Wayback Machine and take a trip to San Francisco in the 1800s to take a look at the birth of yacht racing on San Francisco Bay. Ron? How fun to be at this end of the, uh, of the lectern, as it were. Uh, I immediately have to uh, ask for a speaker's indulgence to acknowledge several of my personal heroes and dear buddies. From the time I was just a little kid, literally, you know, that big, too, 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 too small to be in the men's grill, uh, I have admired the great sailing and great work of Jim Lindsay. And I've admired the incredibly cool writing and great stuff of Carl Nolte. Both of them are here today. Jim Lindsay, Carl Nolte, thank you so much. And incredibly dear buddies, uh, lifelong buddy, really, um, and sailing buddy and boat owner partner. How could he? How could we possibly own boats together? But my buddy Ray Lint is here. Ray, good to see you here. He and my he and my dear buddy uh, Tom Decker are both staff commoners of San Francisco Yacht Club, which you will see played a significant, perhaps the uh, significant role in yacht racing's birth on San Francisco Bay. And of course, we have our dear friend to the north, the general manager of the San Francisco Yacht Club, David Robinson. David, thank you for being here. So you've already seen the background of my incredibly esteemed team. Holy cow, I had to put some really bright folks around me. The issue about where San Francisco Yacht Club started and where the birth of racing began in San Francisco Bay has fascinated me forever. Long before there was a San Francisco, there were people making charts of this shoreline and making charts of uh, the coastline. San Francisco wasn't really recognized in those days. It was one of the little dimples on these old charts. In, uh, but we're going to cover today's talk. We're going to talk a bit about the city, the bay, the yachts, the yachtsmen, early race courses, early rules, and the yacht clubs that organized all this. Uh, in 1844, there were 50 people in San Francisco. It didn't look like much. Paintings show little quaint villages in what is now the, the financial district. That's what you're looking at right there. In 1850, a year after the gold rush, it still looked like this on Market Street. It's still incredible dirt roads on Market Street. Uh, 1851, the bay was filling and filled with boats on the bay. Uh, they'd come from everywhere. As um, I mentioned once before, in the first three years of the gold rush, 300,000 people came to San Francisco from 50 a few years earlier. 300,000, half of them came through the Golden Gate Bridge on a sailboat. Usually they'd been at sea for three or more months. So people who came here were basically able to take care of themselves. They could handle the rough and ready world of sailing. And as the city began to fill, this is 51. Remember, there were 50 people here, you know, five years earlier. This is San Francisco near Market Street in 1951. Now, you see in the background just boats galore, mass, 1851, 1851. Uh, you see all the mass in the background. Many of these boats came into San Francisco, and since the uh, visitors immediately hopped off the boat, they didn't care at, at all about going back. They were here to make a, a fortune if they could, and what they saw was the big gold rush. Um, so uh, now we go down to South Bay, if you go, or uh, Mission Bay, if you go that way, south of us, and I'll show you this on many maps, you'll see it was largely undeveloped, and you see that pier way in the background there, that is something called Long Bridge. That bridge, which I'll show you in several forms, is this bridge right here. This is 1870. Look at this city. Mind you, in 44, there were 50 people here. So when you look at this incredible sea, you see the scene of San Francisco. This is Market Street right here. You see boats coming in the Golden Gate. And by the way, the Golden Gate held that name before there was a bridge there. It was called the Golden Gate because of the sunset, the, the big narrow channel of what we call the entrance of the bay. All of this was considered to be the bay. The bay now is seen as stopping at the bridge. But in those days, it was way out at Land's Inn and Bonita. That's where we saw the edge of the bay in those days. See this boat coming in right here by Fort Point right now. That's, that is another big giant ship coming in in those days. And just to give you a scale of what, what that would be like, this is a picture taken just a few months ago in April 19, 2019. This is a square rigger coming in the bay. So take away the bridge and imagine the scene of one of these coming through our majestic Golden Gate. Back one, this is, this is what's happening right here. So you'll notice that the northern waterfront 
upper right hand corner. I'm sorry. Yeah, my cursor isn't showing well, but in the upper right hand corner. Thank you, Tom. By the way, I want to pause for a second to acknowledge actually a brilliant friend. And I mean that word, a brilliant friend with a long history of contributions to the world of yachting. Our exec, our producer of the Facebook live stream, Tom Eamon. Tommy, sincerely. Very gifted person. So uh, back to what I was saying. If you see in the upper right hand corner, that's a boat coming into, a ship coming into the bay. This is what that looked like. Imagine it's actually a full sight, a ship coming into San Francisco Bay. This was happening regularly, several times a day. And the city was welcoming these people because essentially they realized San Francisco had this great spirit of, of entrepreneurship. <clears throat> a little bit about the city. I said it goes from a sleepy village to a brawling boom town. In 1776, it's founded by a Franciscan priest, the sixth in the California chain of missions. For the longest time, it was just a little northern outpost of Mexico, the sleepy village. In 48, uh, uh, gold is discovered. And by the end of 48, there's 850 people from 50 to 850. In January of 49, literally, it jumps to 5,000 people. There was an official census, 5,000 people. By the end of the same year, 25,000 people. So 50 to 25,000 people in you know just a few years. Uh, by 1850, California was declared a state. We basically, the people in California wanted to become a state and the, and the US of A wanted this to be a state. So the population uh, continues to soar and people who come here have a very high appetite for making bucks and becoming rich. It's the primary motive of people to come to San Francisco. They didn't come here for the sheep. They didn't come here for the farmlands. They came here to basically make dough. Um, square riggers and other boats were filling the bay. By 52, the population was 36,000. Many of these square riggers were abandoned. And in fact, when I had the quest to figure out where the yacht club, the original site of yachting in San Francisco came from, I went hunting for archeologists ultimately. It took years to figure that I should hunt for archeologists. And then I found a maritime archeologist and you'll get to hear from he and Nazi Fino in a bit. But Jim Allen is an expert at finding old uh, square riggers, many of whom are under buildings on Montgomery Street. So he understood the graveyard of these boats that came in and got abandoned in San Francisco. By, 17, by 1870, land rights and water rights were soaring and the population was already 159,000. During that same time, a, a yacht club formed in 1852. Mind you, 1852. 49ers were just three years earlier than this, already a yacht club had founded, Pioneer Yacht Club. It was the first in the Bay, but it didn't, it failed quickly, as the entrepreneurs would say, failed quickly. Well, it did. Uh, and um, uh, the first mention of sailboat racing, which I'll show you in a minute, that I found after spending tons of time in every kind of uh, environment you can find, every archive I could find, uh, from the Bancroft to the uh, library in San Francisco to the museums, etc. The first mention is in 1855. In 1869, San Francisco Yacht Club was founded to create an orderly form of conduct while yacht racing. You'll see why that was needed in a moment. In 1873, the population at 170, 160,000 San, Fran San Francisco Yacht Club incorporated. They'd gone through a little hiatus. They got kicked out of their property because their railroads, who could stop a railroad, took over their space that you're going to learn about in a little bit. By 1896, the PICOA was founded, and these five yacht clubs were the founding yacht clubs. San Francisco Yacht Club played an inordinately large role in the founding of it. Their Commodore was basically the lead dog of all these activities at that time. By 1926, the YRA was founded so that regular yacht racing was scheduled on San Francisco Bay. And in 1927, half of the people at San Francisco Yacht Club basically broke away to form the club we are in here right now, the St. Francis Yacht Club. And it was in those days seen to be on the windy, uh, marina. Nobody really wanted to be here. You'll notice all the population a few slides back. Population was not at all around here. This was basically, you know, empty kind of sand dunes. And then after the, the uh, uh, 1915 World's Fair, it was uh, still not fully developed. So um, 1853, this is Market Street. That is to say the diagonal going from upper right to lower left on the screen is Market Street. 
south of market is largely undeveloped and there's a very large bay and I'm showing with my cursor. But we want these dots on there because we're going to refer to them over and over again. And you see this green dot here, that means something too. Okay. Um, now, the, the, this, this graphic I found has an inherent uh, qu question in it because the all, we all know the San Francisco Yacht wasn't founded until 1869, but in 1855, there was a race. It generally was close to this course. It started right around here, sailed out to the uh, edge of the Fort Point and back. But this, these were generally the way race courses started. They'd go around a stake boat, they'd go around an island, they'd go around something that was reasonably clear, you could understand where it was, and they would come back. Usually they started off the city front, down here off of, um, in this particular case of Leo Street, often Market Street, Piers, etc. Um, now, in 1855, on Sunday, June 24, there was a story, or there, there was a yacht race, and on the Daily Alta Californian, the Daily Alta Californian was a four-sheeter. That is to say, a front page, you open it up, a left page, a right page, you close it, the back page. Four sheets of paper. And I've been all over the archives. And if you look at this carefully, and it's hard to read, so I summarized it here. It says there's going to be a yacht race in San Francisco Bay. And this was written on Monday, the day after the yacht race. And it said the schooner Kate Dodge was going to race against the schooner Olivia. The stakes were 1000 bucks. Just to do the numbers, that's $29,000 in today's money. The start of the race course at, at 10 o'clock, the boats were going to leave their moorings. So they'd be moored at Clay Street Wharf. And they would, in the presence of a large number of spectators, they took off. They were to go around Mile Rock and back uh, to a point, the starting point at uh, the Clay Street Wharf. Breeze was out of the northwest. What a surprise. Uh, but it was smooth, quiet water at 10 in the morning. Again, not a surprise at 10 in the morning. And the commentary in the newspaper the next day said that the little fleet had scarcely got underway when the sailing qualities of the Olivia, the, one of these two yachts, uh, showed themselves. However, a yacht called Alexandra, though not in the air, in the race, <laughs> appeared to be a competitor to the honors of the day and by no means was despised, but she sailed around Olivia, copped another donut around Olivia. She was so fast. She went around Olivia two times and goes far ahead uh, of the Kate Dodge, and but she wasn't really in the race. And so... Uh, uh, and then they say where uh, her throat halyards broke right up here by Fort Point. She loses her throat halyards. They stop. They repair the throat halyards, get it going again. Again, they catch up with Olivia, pass her again. However, the, that boat's not in the race. So the Kate, now seeing that there's no chance for her, withdraws from the race. This is the early days. And so they come back. So the next day in the paper, it says uh, a consequence of misunderstanding of the race yesterday, it turns out that the boats left their moorings, but in fact, nobody knew who won. There was $29,000 in today's money at stake, but nobody knew who won the yacht race. I mean, was this boat that won the race in the race? No. But the boat that would have otherwise won the race dropped out of the race. So who gets the 29 bucks and who pays the $29,000? So what happens is um, they have another race the next day. They decide that they're going to start at three and a half because there's more breeze in. The Kate leads the Olivia. She sails around. They go around a stake boat so close, and they're changing the lead position at this point, that the writers say you could have jumped from the boat taking the lead to the stake boat. You could have jumped off it two feet away because it's a really, really tightly contested race. And they go racing down, and, and in fact, the Kate wins the race because she is the faster boat. So she gets the bucks, but this leaves a kind of a funny flavor in everybody's mind. You bet, you bet $29,000, you don't know if you won. You gotta have another race again to see who does win. It's on a Monday, so nobody's watching. Everybody's at work doing what they're doing. Things are getting a little messed up. So back to our graphic of Mission Bay. Now watch this, this is in 1861, okay? The Yacht Club hasn't found it yet, but in 1861, that original line that I showed you that Nazi was good enough to put on Mission Bay, there's a bunch of other look, blocks of property here. Are those property? No, those are water lots. San Francisco is in the midst of a huge land and, and economic boom, and people are selling spots on the water. They're saying, out here for 100 feet and over there for 100 feet and back here, that's mine. And I paid umpteen dollars for it. And so water lots are beginning to fill up. 
then this is what this is what that same bird's eye view looks like in 68 you see long bridges right here here's mission bay here is the uh you know market street coming from the middle of the screen upper right like that so it looks like that here's a big view of all of the peninsula from san bruno north you'll see mission bay is in the upper right hand corner my cursor is circling the upper right hand corner up there so what happens is a group of avid yachtsmen in 1869, in order to form a more orderly and monitored Corinthian form of conduct, they form the San Francisco Yacht Club. Horace Platt, Eckley, Moody, Ogden, and Tucker. Each of these guys would play, as you can see, a very significant role in yachting in the area. They found a yacht club and their purpose is to stop the confusion on whose $29,000 that prize money was. Because I can tell you, having looked at all kinds of records, that same scenario played again over and over. Somebody bet $25,000 a year later, the same thing. They didn't know who won. And did he go around the stake boat? No, you were just supposed to come uh, around the stake boat in the island. No, he went around the stake boat. He didn't go around the stake boat in the island. There were no marks like we now have, and there were no judges on land, on water. Generally, there were just people in the stake boat. And the people in the stake boat would occasionally have a friend in the race. Who won that $29,000? So back to our chart, we zoom in and we see that square there. And that square is gonna be important. And we zoom in closer. Now, as it turns out, even though there's, in 1869, there's no real land right here. This is all a bay. And it's a kind of a, kind of a laid back bay, but there's this bridge here. It's called Long Bridge. And Long Bridge, remember the railroads are happening in America at this time and, and, and California is now connected. And so what happens is, um, the, the, uh, this bridge, right here, there's a wharf called um, Hobbs Wharf. And this wharf, we're going to see a bit in a, in a moment. I'm going to take you an aerial drone shot of this wharf today. And so uh, this wharf forms out here. And right on that intersection, something happens. Um, this is, in fact, that intersection on the a bigger picture of the bay. And this is a sequence of the 1869 first clubhouse, which is that location I showed you a minute ago where we had a one. There's land there now. That's the first clubhouse. It happens at the intersection of Long Bridge and Hobbs Wharf. And then secondly, when the club gets kicked out of there because the railroad wants their property back because the railroads are coming, and soon enough that's going to be actually a street, which we'll see in a minute. So they move to a meeting location on Montgomery Street. Then they move to multiple other meeting locations through the 74, 5, 6 lane on Clay Street. And in 77, they get their second clubhouse on Sausalito, so location number four. And then in... In 1927, they moved to their fifth location at the same time St. Francis moves here. So five location for San Francisco Yacht Club and the location six for the founding of this club. Now, why all this is happening is illustrated by this graphic. The green bars represent the number of people who came that year. And I don't show every year. I just show every 10 years how many people came in that particular year. And this is the total population of San Francisco. So we're looking at a real genuine boom town. While there's a boom town happening here, people who are getting, you know, who are making money, who have gold and who are basically playing in the dance halls in San Francisco and the other kinds of halls in San Francisco, many of them are buying, building and betting on boats. And in these boats that they're out racing, they're betting real big money like we talked about. However, what's happening in this picture? What's happening with the boat on the right? He's on starboard tack. We know that to be starboard tack. Starboard tack, the guy in the close up, he says, what's that? I don't know what starboard tack is, but if he doesn't move, and he probably didn't move fast enough, this bowsprit, if you just move forward, goes through and strafes the right side of this boat. This guy in front, far picture, he's basically far enough away. He's, you can see him. He's holding course or bearing away. He's safe. These people, if you can look closely, they're literally scampering in the cockpit, moving because they're about to be collided on by this boat. Now, we know this boat has sailing rights. We know it has sailing rights, but in 18, you know, 56 and 57 and 69, nobody else knew that. They had, the rules were being established by yacht clubs. Now, there's a difference between racing on the bay and yachts and the Falugas. The Falugas were boats that raced on the bay, but they were boats that were fishing boats. They were Falugas, you make money. Yachts, you probably spend money. <laughs> there is a difference. 
a lot more varnish on this side, a lot less varnish over here. But the Flugas weren't really the same as yachts. There were lots of them. They were kind of all over the place out here. And the Master Mariners Benevolent Association was founded for the tradespeople on the bay. And the tradespeople represented all kinds of business on San Francisco Bay. There are oyster farms in Richardson Bay. There are people sailing all over the place. And the Flugas, while they were fast, they weren't big. They were small and, and very sporting, but they were not the yachts at the time. So to help us understand more about the timeline, this takes us from 1844, where Yerba Buena, what's Yerba Buena? You see, in 1844, there was no San Francisco. The name of San Francisco in 1844 was Yerba Buena. It had not yet changed its name from Yerba Buena, which would later be named the island. It was still called Yerba Buena. It wasn't yet San Francisco. The first record of racing on the bay, ad hoc scrub races around islands, betting purses, you know, up to and beyond $10,000. I have record of a $25,000 bet. In 1857, we began to have starting cannons, tables and distances. They began to say how long the boat was compared to the distance. You had hand, early handicaps. Signal codes on land where you'd be able to talk to people from land onto the water. The race is about to start and the five minutes, etc. Stake boats. Then in 1860, we have race committees, defined rules, uh, sheets of paper, which are beginning to lay out rules, starboard tack being the principal of them. Um, now, remember, in 1851, the Yacht America had gone to England and come back a winner with real modern technology. San Francisco had a bit of a chip on its shoulder, wanting to be kind of like what was going on over there in the New York side. And the people who founded San Francisco Yacht Club deliberately said they wanted a Corinthian form of yachting. They wanted respect from the rest of the world. They thought their people in boats were fast, but they didn't feel like they were commanding enough respect. <clears throat> In, in 1869, this our San Francisco Yacht Club founds off of Long Wharf with, with 115 members, etc., and it's to create an orderly form of conduct. PICOA comes along in 1995. There are five founding clubs. St. Francis is founded in 96 to avoid the ferry wakes. When you went over to San Francisco Yacht Club by ferry, there was no bridge. You took a ferry over there. You were creating an upsetting environment for people trying to have what would be cocktails, drinks, dinner, whatever it is, on their boats anchored off of the San Francisco Yacht Club, which is now where the Andine is. And so the previous site here of the Pan Pacific Exposition was picked by guess who? When the two, when the club broke in half, one of the members of this renegade crowd was named Hiram Johnson Jr. If the name rings a bell, it's because Hiram Johnson was at that time conveniently governor of the state of California. So he persuades somebody in the city of San Francisco to accept from the state of California the track of land we are on to the end of the spit, which didn't go as far in those days, went down to the lighthouse here. And that piece of land is given to the city of San Francisco on the condition that it be leased for nautical and navigational purposes and coincidentally, his son immediately applies for a lease for the St. Francis Yacht Club. So this yacht club takes over the windy spot on the marina in 1927. In 28, the YRA is formed for regular racing. Now let's go back to our site here. This is Mission Bay again. Here's Long Bridge. Here is Hobbs Wharf sticking out there. This is the, uh, the, uh, that picture. I put that green dot there at the intersection of Hobbs Wharf and Long Bridge. This is a photograph looking south on Long Bridge. We're looking southbound down this long bridge. Mind you, there's water on the far left where these buildings are. And out to the left is a pier, Hobbs Wharf. Okay, it's got lots of names, but Hobbs Wharf's the one we'll use for consistency here. So Hobbs Wharf goes off to the east, off to my left, if you will. And then over to the right is this Mission Bay. And people are having races outside here, way outside to the east of this long bridge. And the races were getting attention, and people in early photography were taking pictures of them. And this is one from, uh, the, generally the most common time for races was in July. July 4th was a big celebration, the 4th and the 5th. People often had very big races. The biggest race of the year was usually July 4th and July 5th. Crowds of people would get on the shoreline to watch the races. And um, this is all east of that long bridge outside of what would be Mission Bay. In 1877, we begin to see the codification of rules, and you see a constitution and bylaws and sailing regulations. So people by this time, 1877, are writing down all kinds of rules and regulations to regulate the activities. Race courses are beginning to be plotted 
uh, you know, on a chart where people can look at it in advance, agree, you know, by observing this in advance, this is going to be the race course. They learn about it, you know, weeks in advance. Uh, this particular page was printed in an annual directory. No question what the race course was. Everybody who's got the directory sees the race course. And people are racing on the bay all through the 70s and 80s. It's a very fun activity, but it's not like the Falugas. People who are yachtsmen feel like they have to, remember, they're, they're, they're spending money. They're not making money with their boats. So they look much more like this. The social calendars uh, get to be very full. The Pacific Inner Club Yacht, not yachting, but Yacht Association is formed in 96. You'll notice San Francisco Yacht Club plays a, pl a big role. Now, why do I keep mentioning San Francisco Yacht Club? It's important when you're a kid to recognize the accomplishments of your dad. And it's important when you're a dad to recognize the accomplishments of your kid. It's a win-win, ladies and gentlemen. It is a win-win for us to have a harmonious relationship with our dad and for them to have a harmonious relationship with their kid. We are essentially the descendants of the pioneers of yacht racing on San Francisco Bay. Now, you've heard of the opening day. Well, opening day really happened as they would open the bridge to get onto Belvedere Island and what is now Beach Road. This, this bridge here was on Beach Road, and you can see this opening still memorialized when you go across from the mainland of Tiburon over to San Francisco Yacht Club, which is over here now. Uh, and this, this opening of the bridge would allow boats that had been wintering inside the sheltered lagoon. The biggest wind in the winter around here is the Southwester. Belvedere offers perfect uh, shelter from a sou'wester. It's this north-south island. So people would be in what is now the lagoon. Dave Allen and his father built the lagoon on this real cheap, uh, pretty much junky area. It was a swampy-like area. And they'd open this and people would come out for uh, yachting opening day. This opening the bridge was why they called it opening day. There were very, very big, this is 1900 in Sausalito, the San Francisco Yacht Club. And, and if you read all about this, the, the activity was incredibly full. I mean, we've all heard about and sent our kids off to debutante balls. Well, guess what? The Yacht Club was the site of such activities. Remember, still, advances technologically were still happening on the water. People were amazed by steamboats, which would go up and down rivers, and they were amazed by the clipper ships were just 15, 20 years in the past that were, you know, getting huge uh, passages from around the world. Look at this sailing calendar. This is April 11th, opening day. This is April 25th. April, April 15th, April 21st, April 27th, April 29th, May 1st, May 5th. This is the sailing program. This is the second half of the season of the sailing program. So the social life in the yacht clubs was rivaled the social life anywhere else in San Francisco. And in fact, they were very significant social environments. The directories or listing of members was a prestigious place to be. We've all got our directories now. There were directories in San Francisco in those days. And as my dear archaeologist, talented archaeologist buddy, uh, Jim Allen has shown me over the time, when you read the directories of yacht clubs back then, you read about the who's who in the society of the time, and you would read the directory of the city, and it was kind of like a yearbook of what was happening in San Francisco or wherever the directory was. We're familiar with phone book directories, some of us who are old enough to remember them, back when you dialed a number as opposed to touched your friend's name in your directory. But in those days, the directories existed before there were phones because in reality, the, the directories were they were listing a who's who in the city and they were mirrored in the directories of the yacht clubs. Big trophies went out for yacht racing in those days. Big, beautiful trophies that were, you know, I mean, they were big, tall, silver things. People would spend lots of money on their boats and bet lots of money on their boats, take it seriously, and yachting was forming as a sport. Remember, the first yachts people were really in 1640 in the Netherlands. The British court took a liking to it, and yachting started in the later part of the 1600s. By this time, 200 years later, it was a genuine, legitimate form of, of sport, and you see it being compared with, and in this case, people are playing baseball or sailing, etc. The racing on San Francisco Bay has not been like the racing on Long Island Sound. 
There are very few scenes like this on Long Island Sound. I just came back from Marblehead. There are no scenes in Marblehead of boats healing over like this in San Francisco Bay. So we had to pay lots and lots of attention to what was happening on San Francisco Bay's racing scene because it was actually kind of dangerous. And people right away had to respect the rules, learn about the rules. And San Franc and, and the first yacht club to put up these rules, San Francisco Yacht Club, was given lots and lots of respect for being the principal organizers. Now back to our map. What's happening by 1905? Remember this long bridge here? Now there's railroad tracks going up and down Long Bridge. What used to be a clubhouse on the water with water on either side of it is no longer a clubhouse on the water. There's land all around it. Now let's take a look at 1911. Holy cow, the whole city is filling up like crazy. And you take a look at that, that, that place where the clubhouse originally was is long since gone. Now here's a picture in 1927. Now here's a picture in now, in 2019, that same dot is right there. Now we take a look at that same dot right now. Ballpark is right here. This is Giants Ballpark, upper right, very top, upper right hand corner is the ballpark. This is the Third Street Canal and below it, this you see that green dot on the right side of the picture, that was the site of San Francisco Yacht Club. Now this is a view for a good reason, looking down what would have been Hobbs Wharf. If you look westward down this green grass, stretch of grass, the edge is the north, the southern edge of this green stretch of grass is called Mission Bay Boulevard South, and the north edge of the grass is called Mission Bay Boulevard North. And if you go down that green stretch going in this picture from right to left, so in this picture, east is to the right and, and uh, west is to the left and south is down and north is up. And you see that square right there? That square is exactly where the first clubhouse for the San Francisco Yacht Club, the first, you know, the oldest yacht club on the Pacific takes place. Now you see, I have a little link right here. It says first. So if I touch this link, we will see It looks like it's playing. Internet crashed, but we'll see if it plays. It's, it seems to be running here, Tommy. Can you show the image? Uh, my screen, because I'm looking at it on my screen right here. Give me my screen. Yeah, okay, hold it. Command F1, yes. Here we go. Great. Here we go. Here we go. So we're at the tip of, we're at the eastern edge of Hobbs Wharf. Now we are flying in a drone by uh, an incredible uh, friend of ours. Pause for a second. He's going eastbound, I mean westbound on Hobbs Wharf. This green stretch was Hobbs Wharf. We're going, as you, I'm going to go back a little bit. We're going westward on it. We're heading westward. And as we go down on Hobbs Wharf, on the left side, we're, we now have buildings there was water. All this whole left area to the left was outside of Mission Bay, and all this to the right was Mission Bay. It was water on both sides of this wharf. All to the right was, was open Mission Bay, and boats were racing and sailing and anchored out here, and fewer boats were anchored on the right side, which is now land. Nobody who goes there now, as we have, many of us have visited here lately as we prepare for this talk. You have no idea that this was basically Mission Bay. So continuing our fly through, this is a drone flying down westward on the wharf. And as you get down to this street from right to left, that car is traveling southbound on what was Long Bridge. 150 years ago, that was Long Bridge heading south from right to left that car would have been driving along what is now Third Street, but what was then Long Bridge. And they're going southbound. So this old bridge ultimately leads way to Third Street and Hobbs Wharf leads to this green stretch of grass with a boulevard, small one on north and south of it. And as we continue along here, wait a second, there is a group forming at what would have been the front door to the San Francisco Yacht Club. Because right in the square right behind them, kind of marked conveniently by these white patches, that's exactly the site. How do we know this? 
because we have brilliant team members like Nazi Fino. Nazi, hand up, please. Nazi Fino has located the exact spots with a um, geo, you know, uh, geometric, I mean, a geographic uh, location system that we can use centuries back. That's exactly where it was. And so as we continue along here, we have gathered the Commodore of the San Francisco Yacht Club. We have the guy who wrote the history book to, to your left, um, Peter Engler, a fourth generation member of San Francisco Yacht Club and a 61 year member of San Francisco Yacht Club and on the historic committee, uh, Nazifino and Jim Allen and this other guy standing over here, they're all raising a glass. They're all raising a glass to smile at, at 150 years of racing on San Francisco Bay. Now, Tommy, if I can go back to here. So here we go. On the sesquicentennial, 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 there'll be a test later. The sesquicentennial of the beginning of racing on San Francisco Bay, the Commodore leads this motley crew. And, I, and you see, I go 1869, 19, uh, 2019, 150 years of racing on the Bay, toasting 150 years of racing on San Francisco Bay. So that's it, folks. <laughs> How fun. Now, you have lots of questions, and if we could ask Jim Allen and Nazi Fino to join me up here, we'll ask the historian of the PICYA and the Pacific uh, uh, Coast Yachting Association to come in, uh, Matt Byers, to ask us any questions, and you are welcome to ask questions as well. Uh, we're good? Okay. Tom Decker, staff commodore at San Francisco Yacht Club, gracious member here. I have a picture at home, my grandfather diving off the top of Von Dean's shortly after the famous opening day 1920 picture, which has my family and a bunch of other families related here. My question is, is there any history on how long it took as the boats were being ripped off their moorings when the ferry service started? <laughs> to get to the stage where they had the grand meeting and the great abyss happened, that is, the splitting of the yacht clubs. Did that go for a long time, or was it pretty fast because of the damage? The club was there from 77, 1877, yep. until 2000, uh, 1927. So the length of time from 77 to 27, and what's that, 50 years or so. Um, and so for 50 years, the club was there in Sausalito. And when, when the club was there, the ferry traffic increased. As Marin County became more populated and ferry traffic increased, it became increasingly a problem. People didn't like it from as soon as the ferry started, but the ferry dock was right next to the Yacht Club. It got worse and worse. You do recall that it burned after 20 years in 97. The Yacht Club over there burned on that location, and we have records of all that. But essentially for 50 years, it got to be a bigger problem and a bigger problem and a bigger problem. A two-liner, then I'll leave. This is, relates to following your children today. My grandmother lived at Sausalito Boulevard in Sunshine. She would look out at the end of the day, like 4.15 to 4.30. Her husband worked in San Francisco coming by ferry. She would look out and watch for the ferry to come in. She would take her three, walk her three children downtown, meet the father, Ernest Laidlaw, member of the club. They would go to the... San Francisco Yacht Club for dinner and then walk home. End of story. What a life. What a life. Okay, uh, Nazi, I actually have an interesting question for you. Um, I understand basically how you were able to locate the original clubhouse of San Francisco Yacht Club down on 3rd Street. But uh, if you could get into a little more detail, there weren't any satellite pictures. There weren't any aerial pictures uh, back then. What did you use to find it? Uh, was it marked on old maps? Uh, how could you get into a little more detail as to how you came 
uh, to find that the San Francisco Yacht Club clubhouse was on that exact spot down to the inch. Yes. Uh, so basically, I used the 1853 map, which is a U.S. Coast map. Uh, this map is just uh, an image, okay. basically. It's an image. But uh, use control points in that map with some landmarks exist until now. So connect actual location to that landmarks uh, in that historic map. Then basically convert that image to an actual XYZ to scale, basically. Put that map to scale. And by put doing that, we'll be able to have any point on that map will be able to get a value or a coordinate. So basically linked an image to actual location using control points exist in that time, uh, mapped in that time and exist until now. And that's how I link the map together. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to. How do you, how do you find control points? Well, you know, uh, piers and things like that, and in um, you know, any bay you should make. Yeah. Yeah. There's, for example, Rincon Hills. We were mentioned earlier. The the tip of the hill is still exists until now. So the Bay Bridge, if you sit under the uh, apartments, that still exists until now. So that's a really very important point we still use until now. So the, actually, if, if you go there now under the bridge, you will see the, the latest remnant of the hill still exist untouched. So that's a very good point. Some of those like, around like in the, bay, in the Golden Gate areas, so those still exist the same time from 1853 or 1869. We could link those locations to the historic maps. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have a question from over here. I, I just let, let me add one more oh, okay. point. Yeah. You, you asked about photographs. There, there were no, are no photographs of the yacht club itself. The, the only photograph we found is the one that you saw in Ron's presentation, where it showed those two buildings on either side of Hobbs Wharf, one of which was um, um, a saloon, and across the wharf were uh, the re was the residence of the owners of that saloon. And in the historic record, it talks about the yacht club being located next door to that building. So we estimated the size of the building in the photograph and then projected what the next building over would be. And that's how we came up with that square. OK. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, I've done some research, into early, some research into early forms of the racing rules. And I found something very interesting with respect to luffing rights uh, when there is a windward lured collision. If the leeward boat could hit the windward boat forward of the main shrouds, rather forward of the main chain plates, then uh, the leeward boat had, the, had luffing rights, windward boat was out. If the collision occurred after the main chain plates, then no luffing rights, and leeward boat was out. Uh, now, <laughs> this, this, seemed to, this seemed to work extremely what well. What a convenient for, test, crash boats to know who's right. <laughs> right, well, in a situation where there's no on the water judging, uh, it made it very clear, at least after the fact. Now. <laughs> In fleets, in fleets uh, of wood boats that are very expensive to repair, uh, do you think there'd be something to be said for bringing this rule back? I, I think it's a really great rule. As a guy with an 82-year-old wooden boat I, with lots of varnish on it, as my neighbor Tom Decker could say, yes, I'd like people to not come close to us. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and have to pray the, pay the price if they did. I'm not in favor of all this haggling on the water, as many of you know. Do not fly red flags of protest, but f actually follow those old rules which say you shouldn't hit boats into each other, no matter what. I love that old rule. <laughs> Tom Decker says he looks at the chain plates on my boat, youngster, every time I come in. He and I are neighbors at San Francisco Yacht Club. More questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you. Um, just uh, uh, if anybody could comment on what happened uh, in the 1870s, 1880s period when something called the Mosquito Fleet occurred and how yachting came from the big boats to, into the common man's purview, uh, and sort of what was going on then with the clubs. 
So the mosquito fleet, Dan, and I'm not surprised uh, Dan would ask a good question like this. A mosquito fleet was very active in San Francisco Bay and its closest counterpart in the trade side was the Falugas and they raced back and forth a lot. The mosquitoes were little small boats, the equivalent of our little, you know, uh, bear boats in Cal 20s and this stuff these days and they were very actively raced. They And they were raced actively, but you didn't notice the Commodores or the leadership of the clubs having those kinds of boats. The, the leaders were tending to be a, a little more higher brow and bigger yachts. In fact, there are lots of 70 foot, it's amazing to think about how old the technology was, but big 70, 60, 80 foot boats in those days. And they generally were the people who were running the clubs. Mosquito fleets did exist and they were big around here. Uh, the mantle went from San Francisco Yacht Club, then over to Corinthian. At the turn of the century, 1890 and early 1900s, the Corinthian Yacht Club was pretty much the premier yachting club in terms of racing in the Bay. And if you look back at all the records, lots of uh, racing is happening around Corinthian, but the mantle got passed from location to location to location. And by that time it was Corinthian that was kind of the hottest club on the Bay. Yeah, something for you, Ron. Uh, something you talked about was the uh, Feluca racing and the workboat racing back in the 1800s, especially the annual Fourth of July race. Now, uh, that was pretty much handled back then by the Master Mariners Benevolent Association, which is still in existence to this day. Actually, it was reorganized in the 1960s. And now Master Mariners pretty much is a yacht club consisting of classic yachts. But what was Master Mariners back in the 1800s and the difference between uh, Master Mariners and a yacht club. Yeah, the Master Mariners Benevolent Association was, as you said, something a cross between a union and a trade fraternity like a Lions Club and so on. And the Flugas were a part of that. They were the biggest part of that. And uh, I, my boat, Youngster, which is 82 years old, actually belongs to both. You know, I'm a member of a couple of clubs, three clubs, and I'm a member of the Master Mariner in a way to kind of tip a hat to the old tradition of the Master Mariners Benevolent Association, which is a wonderful organization founded in 1867. And uh, they did have racing. It wasn't the same as the YCs. We're speaking at a YC, so I talked more about the YCs. But the mosquitoes were the equivalent of the flugas, the yachting equivalent of flugas. Dr. Heineken. When did uh, marinas, as we know them now around the bay, begin to develop? I, I assume all the big yachts were on moorings, but uh, when did that happen? So it depended on the yacht club, but you remember that in 18, 1915, the World's Fair was here and the first marina was made right here with Stone Boatyard being right over there. And Encinel had a marina to begin with, but you're correct. Uh, the technology was such that the people had wharfs more than they had floats and people stayed on anchor. And so when San Francisco Yacht Club was founded or moved in 18, 1927, there was a while before the marina started up. And that was a significant advance by the San Francisco Cisco Yacht Club to create a marina and with, a, with its own breakwater and wall and all the rest of that stuff. We don't see very much of it until the beginning of the century. You don't see marinas like we know until the early 1900s. On that same subject, uh, something I remember seeing in the history book for the Marin Yacht Club in San Rafael, when they were first started in 1929, uh, there was a story about the new Marin Yacht Club being built uh, and uh, it was described as a new way to dock your boats uh, that with uh, docks similar to uh, parking stalls for cars. Remember, remember, Matt is the historian of the PICYA. That's why you know he's the watch captain today. Yeah, and in the, up until the uh, late twenties, basically everywhere, uh, and they still do it down south and uh, back east. You had an anchoring field. Um, everybody uh, in the wintertime, they were at, uh, anchored out in Belvedere Cove for the winter, or they went up to the Turning Basin in San Rafael and anchored out. There was no such thing as a marina like we have it now. That didn't uh, start coming around until the late 20s. Okay, Jim? Well, I, I'm being an old man. I can remember Close mic. sailing. Huh? Close mic. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> I can remember sailing over to Corinthian or San Francisco Yacht Club for a regatta. There were no har there was no harbor. We would anchor out in the mud flats and we'd call for a shore boat. The shore boat would come get us and take us in. I remember at the Corinthian Yacht Club, they had little rooms 
they turned into all kinds of things now, but we used to go sleep in these rooms on the first floor. And uh, Ammonia Alley downstairs is still yeah, there. Yeah, that's where we'd sleep. And then the shore boats would take us back out to our boats the next day and, and we'd race and then go home. So it's wonderful for us to recognize our the collegiality between yacht clubs. I mean, the silliest thing in the world is a hole in the water in which you pour money. So when you see somebody who belongs to a yacht club, another yacht club, a different than your own, I think the th natural tendency we should have is to have empathy and feel sorry for them. <laughs> to recognize they, like you, are suffering with the affliction and addiction of yachting. Uh, Corinthian Yacht Club, yeah, that was that was fantastic. Remember what was swimming around in the water out there too? Who remembers what was swimming around in the cove? Because when I was a little kid in the late fifties, there were lots of stingrays swimming around out there. I had a two ten, and and my buddies had one tenths and and starboats and whatever, and would sail around there. There they'd surface. These stingrays would sail right alongside of you. You'd always see several whenever you came into that uh, Belvedere uh, uh, Cove. Jimmy DeWitt has another question, Matt. I used to come over here. My dad ran all the races upstairs, and he knew every boat on the bay. There were so few. He knew the owners. And I would, mom would get rid of me and give me to dad so she got the weekend off. And I'd go out and watch the fishermen catch stingaray and little sharks. And when the day was over, I would come into the yacht club while my dad, I don't even know if they, they didn't have computers, he would to total up the scores and I'd wait. And then we'd drive downtown and drop the results off to the newspaper. And while I was waiting, I would play the one-armed one bandits that the club had in the other room. And the little ladies, so I didn't bother them, would give me, I don't know, nickels or pennies or something. And my mother got so mad at one of these ladies when I hit the jackpot and she took the money. <laughs> Nazi, I have another question for you. It's like you discussed earlier on how, how you found uh, where the building was and so forth, and how can you be 110% sure that is right where it was? And well, there's nothing like 100%, but, <laughs> <laughs> but very, very, very close. I'll say maybe 99.9. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's really... Um, um, the accuracy of the original map, which is the 1853 map. I think, uh, I'm not sure if we could review that map. Uh, uh, it's really uh, very accurate for two reasons. We did a lot of excavations and we collected a lot of GPS data and match it with the coastline that uh, uh, for that map, for 1853 map, and it's really very close. So for that, I'll say I'm very confident of the accuracy of the historic maps, some of the historic maps. And one of them is the 1853. And then you start building layer after layer. So you could use the 1853 and then you, you, you overlap it with 1869, which is this is our main uh, map and the first map that it's showing the location of the air club. So you just build a layer after layer and then the confidence will be increased. Okay, That's how good. it goes. Uh, Jim, I've got one for you since you're a, a resident archaeologist here. And, um, financial district is known for buried ships. How many ships are out there under the sitting under those skyscrapers downtown? I think probably fifteen to twenty still. Maybe twenty is a little high, but there's a good chance uh, that we're going to find more as more building goes on and excavations get deeper. Okay, and uh, where the Transamerica Pyramid sits, that sits right in it today. That used to be the beach, correct? Uh, it's pretty close, yeah. I'm trying to... Uh, First Street was the edge of the cove and curved around. Mm -hmm. Just can't put uh, the pyramid relative to First Street. I think it's 
east of First Street, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so it might have it might have been in the water. In fact, I think it was in the water. Yeah, it'd be northeast because there was another. Was, uh, I believe I think it was uh, Yerba Buena Cove. Yes, is where the yeah. is where the financial district is now, correct? Right. And yes, Mission sorry. Bay is it's uh, down Soma. Yes, yeah, we were, I was talking about uh, the, the Yerba Buena Cove. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we found uh, we found a ship at the corner of the Embarcadero and Market. We found one at Folsom and Spear. Um, the one at Market Street still there. And in fact, when you are taking Muni to the ballpark, you go right through it. Um, the one that we found at 300 Spear is in a warehouse south of the ballpark. Um, it's the, actually the only ship that's ever been recovered that we've found. Most of them were either destroyed or um, built over. They remain in place. How deep are they? They are, are about 40 feet below the surface, 40 to 50 feet. Are they sinking still or stable? No, they're stable. Yeah, and they're solid. In fact, the one that we encountered at Market in the Embarcadero, when the construction crew hit it, they thought they were just going to tunnel right through it. And um, it, before they hit the ship, they were tunneling at a rate of about 12 or 15 feet a day. And they hit the ship, and they were going 10 to 12 inches a day because the wood was so hard. They could not figure out how to get through it. They tried chainsaws and everything you can imagine. They finally invented a tool or built a tool that looked like a gigantic coffee can with cutting teeth on it. They put it on the end of a, an arm with a spindle and they just sort of ground their way through the ship like that and the tunnel projected through it. So the tunnel goes through the bow and the rest of the ship's still in place. So is the wood pickled? Why is it so hard to get through these ancient ships under the water, or these old ships under the water that have been there 150 years? Well, it was, it was good wood to begin with, very hard oak, and uh, sitting in mud for the last 100 and some odd years has certainly helped to solidify it. Um, and they, the pieces that came out, we actually were able to reassemble them because they, in order to get them out of the tunnel, they had to be cut up into smaller pieces. So we laid them all out on the warehouse floor and sort of reassembled them to document them. And the wood would just seem like it was as good then as it was the day the ship was built. Okay, uh, Ron, do we have uh, time for any more questions? Yeah. Okay, I've got, I have one for you. Uh, going back to the yachting side of this thing, what is the oldest trophy still raced for on the bay? And how long has Whoa. it been raised? How long has it been out there being raced for? Well, I don't, that's a really good question, and I'm embarrassed to confess I don't know if it's the uh, perpetual cup. I don't think it is, but it might be the perpetual cup. But I don't know. Good, really good question. I wish I knew the answer. Who out here knows that answer? Come on, got to have somebody who knows that question. But if I have, we have the journals, and we can find out. So I'll know within a day. Right. Ray, Staff Commodore Ray Lent has mentioned that Perpetual Cup is 120 years old. If that's my guess that that's the oldest, but I don't want to tell you that I know that. Is that the San Francisco Bill. Perpetual Cup? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the other one that I would suspect could be the little... This is Jim... Uh, this is Bill Kramer, uh, Commodore of the... Bill Gargan. Bill, Bill, Bill Gardner, Gardner, Commodore, Gardner, Commodore of the PSCYA with a question, Bill. Go ahead. I mean, a yeah, comment. I, I'm still stuck with trophies and uh we have the little lipton which is a beautiful cup and and i'd like to look at that and, and get a hold of the perpetual cup but that's a good i'd like to find out good so, question yeah. Matt. okay and uh another one do you know what the first trophy ever raced for in the bay was I couldn't find, uh, I, I hunted for the very first race. There was no name for the racing in 1855, and it wasn't for a trophy. It was later than that that they started actually having cups. There was just prize money at first, so I don't know, and it's a really great question. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the perpetual, but I don't know. But it probably would have been at San Francisco Yacht Club because they were showing trophies in the late 1880s. And that's the earliest trophy picture that I've seen. How are Jim, I was just going to say, I think I have uh, some information about one earlier than that in my notes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it at the time, but um, I'll look back and see if I can find that. In, in researching this talk, we did tremendous amount of research, and as uh, Jim just got through saying, we have lots of other data points that we didn't record for the talk, but that's a really good question, Matt. Commodore Honeycutt. Uh, Ron, regarding the San Francisco Perpetual, since 
this club uh, was fortunate enough to win it back last year. <laughs> and with it, we got all of the notebooks. And there is a page uh, in wonderful script, fountain pen calligraphy script, entering the name of the yachts and the name of all of the competitors, sailors on the yachts, going all the way back to the beginning. I think it's out in the trophy case outside. So it's really a fun thing to look at with your gloves on. <laughs> all right, uh, do we have any, uh, one more question from the uh, audience? Uh, Paul? Okay, quick question with a uh, possibly very long answer. Can any of you tell the story of the demolition of Blossom Rock? Yeah. They blew it up. Yes, I... <laughs> no, the, 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 the interesting point, as, as, as I recall, was that uh, there were instructions. Uh, it was widely publicized all over the city. It's going to be blown up at 8 in the morning on some particular day. Everybody, please stay inside. So the appointed time came around, and every inch of the waterfront was covered with people who came out to see the explosion. It's a very interesting story. The engineering is really interesting as well. Um, in fact, I just sent Ron a paper that I wrote on uh, on the Blossom Rock and Shag Rock and Arch Rock, um, all of which used to project above the surface. Um, so maybe at some point we can come back and talk about that. So the price to do to demolish Shag Rock was twenty five thousand bucks. And it went up because they didn't, they couldn't succeed at first. And Jim forwarded to me pictures of like a six-story explosion of water going straight up. Amazing big explosion. So these were important things to get out of the waterfront and off the out of the bay. And they would hire demolition people to go out and get rid of these rocks that that ships kept crashing into. One more. Yeah, one more question. All right, Keith. Uh, Ron, as a um, as a marketing man, you obviously know the idea of a teaser, and the teaser at the beginning of your uh, talk was uh, you waved your cell phone around and said, "If you point this phone at something, it will tell you what it looked like in 1851." Could you enlarge on that? <laughs> yes, it'll be fun. <laughs> You already heard about the technology which Nazi talked about, which allows you to superimpose a historic uh, picture event or location uh, onto a modern landscape. And in fact, the technology exists, and we are all discussing it, the three of us, uh, being able to basically do sightseeing right now in 2019, where you can look at where the ferry boat blah, 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 crash in the ferry boat blah, 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 and see it on your phone. And yes, we are very intrigued by this very cool activity, which could be of interest to tourist bureaus anywhere and everywhere, not just in San Francisco Bay. Is that enough, Keith? <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, thank you. Okay, this has been... A great talk. We, I could sit here all afternoon and do this, but uh, apparently we have run out of time. So I'd like to thank our speakers and thank all of you for coming to today's Wednesday Yachtsman's Luncheon. Luncheon adjourned.